What's going on, everybody? Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You know my guest. He's the one and only Sam Monson. You can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Sam. You can find the podcast, of course, wherever you find your favorite podcasts at the PFF NFL pod. Sam, welcome back. It's been a crazy week in Green Bay. The Packers lose to the 49ers in a game they had every chance to win. And the Green Bay Packers have already started to make some major decisions. Uh, Joe Barry has been let go from defensive coordinator. They signed a new kicker today. They let go of their strength and conditioning staff. So things are happening uh, fast and furious here in Green Bay. But in the meantime, how the heck have you been? Yeah, been good. Been good. Uh, unfortunate way, obviously, for Green Bay season to end. But, you know, if you zoom back out and take the season in its an entirety, it's, it still ends up as a, a wildly successful and overachieving year, I think. It really, really does. And I can't wait to dig into that with you. Of course, the big and most recent news for Green Bay has been the decision that they are moving on from Joe Barry. It was reported earlier this week that he was still under contract. A lot of people assumed that uh, it was going to be a normal three-year deal and they didn't extend him at any point and that his contract was just up per match Schneidman of The Athletic. That was not the case. He was still under contract but they did decide to ultimately move on. There have been some rumblings that maybe he could stay within the organization. Not sure how that would particularly work, but he is no longer going to be the defensive coordinator in Green Bay. Sam, your initial thoughts to hearing that they're moving on from Barry and yeah, we'll just start there actually. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, when you consider what happened in that 49ers game, the biggest flaw came back to the surface at the wrong time, right? We, we had been talking a few times in the show. It's not that everything is bad. Um, and he showed the last couple of weeks before this game that there's some very good defense within his system, within his playbook, within his uh, realm of, of presiding over this whole thing. But the biggest criticism was at the worst possible times when everything was on the line, you need it on this drive. That's when the defense got passive and backed off and got way too soft and just allowed things to be too easy for opposing offenses. And it happened a few times during this season and it came back at the worst time in this 49ers game, you know, with whatever it was, six minutes left on the clock. The 49ers have been struggling. Brock Purdy hadn't been playing well. And that's when Green Bay got just crazy passive on defense and really didn't come after him at all, except for one third down, I think, during that drive. And they just made it too easy. And now, you know, the narrative all week has been, well, Brock Purdy played bad, but when he had to have it, that's when he came good. And like, Well, he did, but like the defense was a big part of that as well. Like who deserves more credit slash blame for that Brock Purdy for turning into Joe Montana on one drive or <laughs> the guy that let him do that by sitting back and making life too easy. I think the like Green Bay, I think have determined that the answer to that question is that was more Joe Barry's fault than it was Brock Purdy being Joe Montana. Yeah. The joke around Green Bay is that Joe Barry's been a bit of a kingmaker all season long, Baker Mayfield turning into another version of Joe Montana in his game. Of course, Purdy at the end of this game, who can forget the Tommy DeVito Giants game on Monday Night Football? That's been a bit of his MO. And, and kudos to you because right before that drive happened, you tweeted it out. You said, like, this is a huge drive for Joe Barry in this defense. And I'm obviously paraphrasing here, but like, they've been passive in these positions all season long. They can't do it here. And then, of course, they go out and be super passive. And the crazy thing is, I was talking about this earlier this week, is that that was like the worst thing that could happen in that situation. You almost yeah. want to be super aggressive in that situation of like one, if you make, if you get a sack, a turnover, a fumble, whatever it might be, like, obviously you probably just win the game. Um, if you don't, at least they score, but like you have a ton of time left on the clock rather than one minute, you know, two or three timeouts and you're a little bit more rushed to go down the field and score. If you would, if they had scored immediately with like even three, four minutes left, you might even have an out where you can either punt the ball away or there could be a disastrous Jordan Love interception and you might still have the time, two minute warning and timeouts left to potentially even get the ball back. So like the one thing that you could not allow in that situation is this passive brand of defense, allowing them to march all the way down the field, taking up five minutes off the clock and leaving you with one minute now down by a field goal. And it's exactly what happened. Yeah, the only thing worse than them scoring immediately because you got too aggressive is exactly what happened, which is they yep. still scored, but it took almost all the time off the clock and gave you very little opportunity or made it very difficult for you to answer the score. So it's one of those weird situations where sort of old school mentality actually ends up working against you and the, the attempt to be safe is actually the worst thing you can do. 
It really, really was. And it certainly cost the Packers and it cost Joe Barry in that situation as well. As you look at the landscape right now of potential defensive coordinator candidates, obviously it's extremely early in the process, but is there a candidate that you have on the top of your mind that Green Bay should look to go after or just even a type of scheme or philosophy? What would you like to see Green Bay do to attack this open position? Yeah, it's tough. We're we're in a strange place right now where previously, you know, Vic Fangio's scheme had been the one everyone was gravitating towards and trying to get guys from that scheme. There have been a couple of them, though, that haven't worked out that well recently. And specifically, that Shanahan offensive tree has gone after those guys, which means I think that coaching tree, that system on defense has actually lost some of its teeth because the best offenses in the NFL or the most prevalent scheme right now has got a better idea of how to attack it. So now... You know, you're looking, uh, Jim Harbaugh looks like he's coming into the NFL um, with the Chargers, maybe bringing his defensive coordinator with him from Michigan. Uh, Mike yep. McDonald from the Ravens is running the same kind of scheme. Maybe that is the one to try and, and poach guys from. Um, but there's not as many of those guys right now. There's a, a much smaller tree. The branch is a lot smaller. It hasn't been developing for as well, long. So trying to find those guys and, and get ahead of that curve, I think, is going to be a difficult uh, task for some guys that want that system. Yeah, Anthony Weaver Jr., obviously the Ravens, I think defensive line coach, if I remember correctly. Um, he's the assistant head coach as well. I know that's been a name that's been out there a little bit. Um, there's a couple different directions that they could go in, but I'm with you. Obviously, that if anyone's been watching that Baltimore style of defense, it's been working amazingly, and it seems to be what everyone is going to try to gravitate towards. It's so hard with these trends because you always want to get there at the beginning of it, whereas, like you said, now this Fangio-style system is going – um, out of vogue and this Raven style is becoming in vogue. I'm really interested to see what type of targets they have in mind. Um, obviously, th this is a huge hire for Green Bay. I know Matt LaFleur had to get involved from a defensive side of the ball this past season um, and, and really kind of take some of his time away from the offense. And I'm sure he wants somebody to come in and have full autonomy of that position and not have to worry about it as much. He hasn't done great in hire. Of all, of all the things that he's done well, hiring coordinators has not exactly been his forte so far. If Green Bay does have legitimate championship aspirations with this young team moving forward, we know they're going to have to develop a top 10 defense in some way. And of course, the one of the best ways to do that is by getting a smart defensive mind in the room. I, I think this is a super important hire for Matt LaFleur. Absolutely. And it's young on both sides of the ball. So it's not like the defense is sort of, you know, established and veteran. You can kind of just leave them to their own devices. Like there's a lot of young players that the new defensive coordinator is going to have to develop just alongside the offense and all those young receivers, et cetera, et cetera. Like it, it is, it's absolutely an important side of the ball for them as well going forward. One other Ravens coach, Chris Hewitt, Ravens secondary coach and passing game coordinator could be another name from that tree. Right, uh, let's jump back for a moment to Packers 49ers. Tons of opportunities that Green Bay had in this game. The Darnell Savage potential interception, Keyshawn Nixon had a potential pick. Jordan throws two interceptions. You've got the missed field goal. Um, we'll get to kind of the big picture and sort of the success story of this team in just a moment. But as you looked back at this game, it felt, at least to me, like Green Bay had every opportunity to win, maybe even played better throughout the course of the game, but just could not get the job done when it mattered most. How did you kind of see this game play out and what was your view of it as you kind of rewatched it? Yeah, much the same. Um, I think Green Bay was the better team on the day and they just, they didn't, get enough plays they didn't find uh they, they made too many mistakes didn't find enough ways of getting it over the line and you know couple that with barry's defense getting really soft right when it, it couldn't afford to do that and gave the 49ers the lead um they did exactly what we talked about you know they took the ball again they went down scored okay it was only a field goal this time instead of a touchdown and they had an opportunity on the next drive to do what we've been talking about doing to this 49ers team which is score first get a stop score again put them in a double-digit hole, and change the entire outcome of the game, change the game script completely. Darnell Savage had a pick and dropped it. And, you know, we just talked about Savage last week. He had a great game, yep. the, the previous playoff game. He had, I think, three significant individual mistakes in this game, that all of which were huge. I mean, if you're going to screw up three times, I don't know that you could have chosen three higher That's leverage true. ways of doing it than the way he did. He dropped an interception, which probably would have been a pick six, but at least a, a, a red zone type of opportunity yeah. to go up a second score. Um, so potentially drops a touchdown. He then misses a tackle on one-on-one -on -one with Christian McCaffrey at the second level that turns into a touchdown. So that's like, that's like a 10, 14 point swing with two mistakes. 
And then he gets wrecked one-on-one by George Kittle on a play that leads to a touchdown as well. So three mistakes, that's like 21 points in all going against Green Bay, all of which can at least be attributed in part to Darnell Savage with just three mistakes. And, you know, brutal for him because particularly that first one. Okay, a lot of people are going to miss tackles on Christian McCaffrey. Uh, There was another one with his other touchdown as well, you know, and George Kittle's a tough cover. But if a ball is thrown into your hands... You can't drop those. It just the margins are too fine at, you know, divisional playoff level, championship level. You can't leave those plays on the table. And they did, particularly in the, in those circumstances early in the game where they could have put the 49ers under scoreboard pressure. Massive, massive opportunity went begging for that one play. And that's unfortunately been a bit of the Darnell Savage experience where One week he's the hero, the next you get completely inconsistent play and you just don't know what you're going to get on a week-to-week basis. And that makes it so hard to game plan with a player like that who might come up with a big play or might have one of his better games and then the next week it's the exact opposite. You just don't know which one's going to show up. I wanted to ask you in specific about that dropped interception and just sort of a, a PFF philosophy on that one because for me, I graded that as a pretty significant negative play on the day and I had people say, Well, he still had a pass breakup on the play. It has to be positive in some capacity. For me, I look at it and say, if he did something like incredible to kind of break on the ball and like was ranging across the field and had the opportunity to pick, even if it was like the play against the Cowboys a week ago where he like reads it perfectly and jumps in front of it and makes a play and drops it. To me, that's like, all right, he it's a huge bummer that he dropped the pick and there probably is some negative that goes along with that, but he still made an epic play in that situation. As I watch this one, He's just there, in my opinion, and the ball gets thrown to him. Purdy doesn't see him, and it's just like a routine, as routine can be, catch at the catch point, and he just drops it. And to me, I that's just a pure negative to me, but I, I was curious how you guys saw it. Yeah, so it, the the previous one, I think, is a great um, example. We've had this this conversation with, um, with NFL coaches, uh, a, a defensive back coach, a defensive coach years ago, was making that exact argument. They were like, look, if we if we have a guy and he drops an interception, it's always a negative grade for us. You know, we're going to downgrade that guy for failing to take advantage of a huge opportunity. Exactly what we're talking about. Massive swing and he left that play on the table. And our point was exactly the point you made about that Cowboys interception. If he dropped that pick, it was still a great break and it was still a pass breakup. That's a positive play. It's just that he left an even more positive play on the table. But you yep. can't say because he had the opportunity to make a bigger play, the one that he did make doesn't count. Like it's still, if, if you take that, if he didn't even try and pick it off and he just swatted it down, you'd be like, that's a great fast breakup. It's a positive play. To not give it the same grade as that seems crazy to me or just yep. not the way PFF works. We're like, it's fundamentally the same play as you would get and you would get a plus one grade for that. If he catches it and brings it back, it's a plus two grade. It's you know twice as good or whatever. So that, that's how we would grade that Cowboys one. And I agree with your interpretation of this one as well. It's not really the same. He's basically just sitting there in, in the hole. He's sitting there ready for that play and takes like a step to his left once the ball arrives. It's thrown to yep. him. So yep. it's not the same level of positive to break it up. Um, it's more of a neutral play from his point of view. It's thrown right to him. It's an opportunity given to him, and he didn't take advantage of that. Yeah, we are in lockstep there, and I'm glad I'm not going crazy because it felt like that was the the clear and obvious way to grade it. But I know, again, that this is always the fun part of it is people see different plays differently. But that's how I saw that one. Again, the the missed tackle and the whole, you bring up a phenomenal point. Like Christian McCaffrey, sometimes you have to tip your cap. And like, that's a dude that makes that play and a lot of players and makes other players look silly. But um, it, it's, a, it's a tough it's a tough scene when like you've got them one-on-one in the hole and it's an opportunity to make it a, I don't know, eight or nine yard gain on the play. And instead it becomes a 39 yard touchdown run, obviously involved in the George Kittle touchdown. He did have a couple of nice plays late in the game, but we just, like you said, we just talked about him as having maybe one of the better games of his career a week ago and arguably one of the, the worst games of his career when the Packers needed it the most one week later, it will be interesting to see how Green Bay goes about him in free agencies and unrestricted free agents. I'm very curious to see how Green Bay does it and it, you know what type of deal he gets on the open market this offseason as well. Uh, another key player in this game, almost uh, very similarly, the player that we were talking about on the offensive side of the ball last week was Jordan Love and the phenomenal game that he had against Dallas. This week, I believe he was PFF's lowest graded quarterback in the divisional round, a 54.0 grade. 
the two interceptions are really, really tough to overcome. I would assume the last one is about as, as bad of a grade as you could possibly get on an individual play, especially with those sort of stakes on the line. Um, he had a pretty nice day up until the first interception. Zach Tom goes out. I don't know how much that played a factor into the pressure and what type, you know, type of pressure he was feeling. But ever since those last four drives, interception, three and out, missed field goal, interception, everything just kind of fell apart for the offense. Yeah, and it, it's difficult to work out both with Jordan Love and with Brock Purdy, you know, how much the conditions played a part of it. Um, you know, like his his first interception is an interesting play as well because it's it's obviously it's a bad play. Like he missed the throw and he missed it by a fair amount. Like it's a, and this was, it, it almost felt like Jordan Love went back to the player that we talked about earlier in the season where everything was just yeah. inconsistent and he missed way more throws that were, that he should have. The ball location wasn't good. The accuracy wasn't good. And that throw was a great example, right? It's it's a simple, open, shallow route right in front of him. And he missed it by like a yard and a half. You know, a, a tight end, Tucker Craft, a big, tall guy with a massive wingspan, just about got fingertips to it behind him. And obviously that was the worst thing that could have happened because it pops it up and now it's an interception. So he gets downgraded for it, but it's, it's actually not even a turnover-worthy play for us because it required like the tip up, you know, for if he just sure. missed it and it went straight by him, Tucker crack like six inches more miss of it. Tucker doesn't even touch it and it just drops harmlessly into an acre of space. So he gets downgraded for it. He doesn't get a turnover where they play for it. But that felt like Jordan Love from earlier in the season, where it's just like, why, why are we not making those throws? Like that that shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. The one at the end felt like more the sort of that's always been on the horizon with Jordan Love, you know, that every now and again there's going to be one of those plays in there and again recently he hadn't had them he'd really sort of cleaned up that area and he hadn't made the catastrophic mistake but it's difficult to know how much the weather affected both of those guys because neither yeah. quarterback played well purdy we saw earlier in the season against cleveland struggled in the rain um throws like this the first interception I, I feel like he doesn't miss that even in the earlier you know inconsistent jordan love time I don't yep. know if that ball just slipped a little bit and that explains why it's two yards, a yard and a half away from where he wanted to put it. So I'm a little reluctant to sort of hammer him for it as opposed to just saying it was a wet game. The conditions were bad. Neither quarterback played well. But ultimately, whether or not that was the cause of it, the reality is we got an earlier version of Jordan Love and they needed the guy that we'd had for the last sort of, you know, eight weeks showing up in this game. Yeah, they really did. I think that the compliment to Jordan is that, you know, when you saw a couple of those passes in this game, it felt so weird because we hadn't seen it in so long. And I know, it, you know, it's only half a season or whatever, and we did see it earlier in the year, but we had come so accustomed to it. Anytime the ball was leaving his hands, something good was happening. There was usually a wide open wide receiver chilling down the field that when it panned downfield, it was like, oh, there's going to be some Packers receiver just chilling there open. And to see a couple of those plays in this game sort of revert back. And again, maybe the weather did play uh, a role in that as well. Um, I, I think it's almost like a, a compliment to Jordan that we just haven't seen that version of him in a while. And I don't think it's going to be something, hopefully, that um, you know continues moving forward. Hopefully, he just learns from it. But uh, definitely will be something to kind of keep an eye on as we go into next year. Speaking of kind of the season as a whole and as we transition off of 2023 and start looking ahead into 2024, you mentioned it at the very onset of this episode the Packers had a really impressive season, overachieved, exceeded expectations. As you look back in this Packers season as a whole, uh, what did you kind of take away and how do you see them moving forward? Yeah, I mean, just a massive successful season relative to expectations. I mean, this was not a team that was expected to be in the postseason. They weren't a team that was expected to be good, let alone contending for the playoffs. You know, when everyone thought Detroit would win the division. And then it was sort of which other team that nobody's really talking about could surprise and maybe go on a run. And people brought up Chicago, people brought up the Vikings. Nobody talked about Green Bay. And we actually had a few couple of people sort of, you know, email in Packers fans and make the case like, hey, you know, in this optimal scenario, Green Bay could be the team that, that shows up. And you were always like, I mean, sure, but it's not likely, right? And that's yep. what happened. They, I mean, they started badly. It didn't look good. It looked like exactly the way everybody was expecting it to look. And then it started to come together. And all of the young players, almost without exception, like the actual development and impact from the youth that they that they went with, the fact that almost none of those guys has sort of underperformed expectations. Um, ironically, maybe the one that has has been the first round draft pick. Like knew, yeah. everything else, though, hit. 
everything else hit. And that's insane. Like, and who knows if that's going to be the case going forward. But if that, if their draft that they just had continues to progress the same way it's going to be you know one of the best single drafts a team has had in the last 10 years and every time a team has one of those it tends to propel them you know into a successful run like the chiefs yep. right now have had one of the best runs of drafting for years of any team um the seahawks dynasty you know the few years of the legion of boom was built off like two drafts um the saints had one where they propelled themselves to the playoffs with an yep. insane draft if you're able to have one of those drafts where you hit on like five guys and they all become cornerstones for you, the value that that saves relative to having to spend to get the same level of outcome on the open market is so huge that it's it's almost hard to fail at that point if you have viable quarterback play. And right now it looks like both those things are happening at the same time for Green Bay. So it's impossible not to see you know next season and beyond like the future being very bright for this team. Totally agreed and can't wait. It, it It's almost unfair that it feels like the season's already so far away because we were just sort of getting to know this team and uh, the excitement was building. And then it, of course, comes crashing down against San Francisco, but they should have the foundation that they need moving forward to be successful. As you kind of look at this team, we know they need a new defensive coordinator. That's going to be 1A on the shopping list. But what are your other biggest needs for this team and what are some of the things that they might need to change moving forward? I think that they can really invest on defense almost exclusively. Like, I think the offense has shown enough that you can basically step back and say, we're good to go. Like, these guys all look like they're getting better. All the receivers looked encouraging. The offensive line is good. You can you can never have too much offensive line depth. So, you know, maybe we'll spend a couple of draft picks there and, and hope we can add some some players. But it's not a, it's not a glaring area of need. Let's just focus on defense. And, and let's really plow some resources into getting impact players there. But Honestly, a big thing I think is just stepping back and letting this team develop. And that's where, like, that it's where I think it's encouraging or maybe a slightly different feeling to some other teams where, you know, you get these kind of the, everything feels great. It's almost like a team of destiny and it doesn't quite happen. And there's that terrible feeling that it's gone. Like, this was it. This was the chance. And now it's never going to come back again. A lot of the time, it's because you look at how many players from that team are, are not going to be back, you know, because it's hard to keep a roster together. But you've got a ton of veterans and we're going to have to lose him and this guy's retiring. And Green Bay's not in the same situation as that because so many of these guys are young. Almost everybody we just, you know, fell in love with as a story and as a, a positive sort of member of this story, of this uh, this fairy tale is back next year, theoretically back better next year. So yeah. it makes them a really captivating team going forward. Yeah, I tweeted out earlier this week of what this team looks like if they don't sign a single free agent, draft a single player, if they lose all of their unrestricted free agents, if they do some salary cap cuts like Devondre Campbell and don't, and then, you know, Bakhtiari doesn't come back or whatever might happen right. there. And it's like the same team that just went out and challenged yeah. San Francisco in the divisional round, which is really, really fun. Uh, it should be a really exciting journey for this team. And oh, by the way, they have five top 100 picks. They're going to have a little bit of money to spend in free agency. They're going to bring back some of their own guys. And maybe, uh, who knows what happens with Bakhtiari, but if they do end up with that back, like that's another key addition too. Uh, I'm I'm so excited about this offseason and obviously getting a new defensive coordinator as well. Uh, transitioning off the Packers for a couple last questions before we get you out of here, Sam. Uh, let me first ask you a Chicago Bears question. Uh, they decide to hire Shane Waldron uh, the, as their new offensive coordinator, obviously most recently with Seattle. Your thoughts on the Waldron hire and, and um, you know, kind of what that means for their offense moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a solid hire. I think he's done a good job um, both of his last stops and, and is running the type of offense that can succeed pretty much anywhere. The, Any time the Chicago Bears make a move from now until April, the, the real question is going to be, what does this mean about Justin Fields or Caleb Williams? Like, does this indicate one or the other? I don't think that it does. Uh, if it does, if it means anything for that dynamic, I would say it enhances the idea that Justin Fields might stay there, you know, that, that because Waldron has success um, recently, you know, getting sort of recalibrating a quarterback, you know, or getting a yep. career year out of a quarterback and, and de developing that specifically from a passing point of view. It's obviously the area that Justin Fields still needs to take the biggest step in. So if it changes it at all, I think it makes it slightly more likely that they are willing to go with Justin Fields again and do whatever with that first pick, trade it away or, you know, even use it on somebody. Um, but I don't know that it changes much. 
I agree. And, and certainly a better sign than if they would have hired Cliff Kingsbury, that would have been the, that would have been the only semi yeah. sort of tell if they went with Kingsbury it would have been like, okay, that, that more feels like they're deciding on Williams. Even then I, it, there still, I think would have been some ambiguity, but that would have been the bigger tell, but I'm with you. I do think Waldron at least opens the possibility that maybe, maybe they would stick with Justin Fields. And the Kingsbury thing felt more like just research than I don't know Probably. what their interest was in him, but if you're thinking about drafting Caleb Williams number one, if you didn't right. interview Kingsbury, it would yeah. just be leave, missing an opportunity. It would be leaving something on the table. Like, why would you not bring him in to talk about him and spend his entire interview just asking him about Caleb Williams? Like, there's no downside yeah. to that. So, assuming that's what they were doing, I think that's perfectly sensible and you know a smart thing to be doing if they were actually seriously considering him as the new offensive coordinator i mean it's difficult to find justification for that in his recent history as a coach i don't like to give the bears credit but if that was their case of trying to hire uh, or you know gain more information it, it's super smart and it makes a ton of sense uh, last but not least we got two big conference championship games coming up this week uh your thoughts on the two games and what you're most looking forward to watching yeah two great games i think um Thanks. obviously the, the ravens chiefs like that that just looks like a fantastic game. Um, Kansas City's offense has looked more like Kansas City's offense the last couple of weeks. On the other hand, they did it against a team that literally ran out of pass rushers and another team that literally ran out of linebackers. So does that look the same against the Ravens, who have probably the best pass defense in the NFL? I don't know, but the, the difficulty level is getting ramped way up. Um, so I feel like both of those defenses will actually have some good success slowing down the opposing offense. Uh, and it's going to come down to which freak show superstar quarterback makes enough you know, big plays or, or a mistake here or there. Um, the other game I think is more interesting because like the Lions, and this, this is maybe a hard sell on a Packers podcast, but the Lions are like everybody's second team now, right? The, the story, even, even in Green Bay, they're like, they're like they're like the fun little brother. They're like still kind of annoying, but not like the other two well annoying brothers. Like they're kind of fine, so we're mostly okay with it. Yeah, you probably don't want them to win the Super Bowl, but to get there would be, you yeah, know, would be okay. Um, but it's such a compelling story for a few reasons. Like number one. They're one of four teams that have never even made it to a Super Bowl, two of which are like fairly recent expansion teams, right? Basically, them and the Browns are the only long-established team that have never even made it to the game. Um, number two, when they hired that new regime, they came in and immediately said, this is not going to happen in a year. It's going to be a two-, three-year project, and we're going to do this thing the right way. We're going to build it from the ground up. It's going to be a long-term, sustainable period of success. And number one, they were given the time and freedom to do that. And number two, they've successfully achieved it. So that I think is really fun to watch happen in this day of like instant, you know, gratification. And I need it now. Otherwise, we're firing everybody. Uh, and then, you know, number three, they like Dan Campbell, the fact that they have been aggressive, they're like, they're just a fun sort of story from that point of view as well. So I think the 49ers are a better team. I think they're rightly favored, but the fact that the Lions are so compelling on a number of different levels just makes it a fun matchup. Totally agreed. As a football fan, the, the, the Detroit story is really, really fun. And as somebody who enjoys watching team building and roster building to see how it's done and when it's done the right way, it's been really, really fun to see them put this team together. San Francisco, obviously, too, who's done a lot of really smart things on their side. And um, there's obviously no one perfect way to build a team up, but you see four teams that have gone about it uh, a really impressive way. And I'm really excited to see what matchup we get out of these two games. Should be a really fun week of football. Sam, I cannot thank you enough for doing this all season long. It's been an absolute joy to get to talk to you and pick your brain every single week. Um, your attention to detail, I know you cover 32 teams, the draft, everything else. The fact that you can come on a Packers podcast and have the attention to detail just on the Packers, super, super impressive. So uh, thank you so much. And obviously tell everyone where they can find your work all, all season long. Yeah, the uh, the PFF NFL podcast, either on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. So look, thanks a million for having me and hopefully uh, your listeners have enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been a ton of fun. We've got a ton of amazing comments. Make sure to go find him. And of course, go follow their podcast. It's so freaking good. PFF NFL pod. You can find our podcast at Packaday Podcast. Of course, you can find me at Andy Herman NFL. That is going to do it for us today. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.